Okay, Jet fans, Darrell Revis. Baby is off the board. The New York Jets select Makai Beckton, Louisville. Pressure just makes you go a little more. I kind of like pressure a little bit. The New York Jets select. Welcome to another edition of NFL Draft Preview presented by Verizon with the Athletics. Dane Brugler. Dane, we got some sun shining today. It's a beautiful day. It's March 22nd. We're talking about the offensive tackles that are draft eligible, that have declared maybe could end up in green and white. Some might. Some probably will not as well. But before there's the draft, there's always free agency. So the Jets have added some players. Has anybody stood out to you? Any signing stood out to you? Well, I thought it's interesting how many former first-round picks uh, they've signed with Corey Davis and Sheldon Rankins, uh, Jared Davis in there as well. Uh, But I think the signing that stood out the most has to be Carl Lawson. Um, I was a big Carl Lawson fan coming out of Auburn. I think I had a second-round grade on him. He goes to the fourth. Um, Just a a quality, high-effort player uh, in terms of his rush skills, um, in terms of uh, what kind of uh, hustle he's going to give you on a snap-to-snap basis. Really heavy-handed uh, pass rusher. You love that about him. So, you know, this is a team in the Jets that have been, you know, really looking for that impact pass rusher for a while now. And I, I think they landed him in Lawson. He's going to give them a little bit of juice off the edge, help Quinn and Williams, help the rest of that line. So it should be uh, should be a lot of fun to watch as this new coaching staff uh, gets their hand on a really quality player. And that defensive line. Looks a little different now. Looks pretty good compared to where it was, let's say, when we recorded last week with yeah. Carl Lawson, Quinn and Williams, Sheldon Rankins, even somebody like John Franklin Myers and Paul Aronzo Fadukasi. Mm-hmm. Very good players last year for the Jets. You know Robert Sala wants to build up the defensive line. Step one in that definitely seems to be complete. We'll see what happens not only in free agency, but the rest of the offseason and most notably the draft, which is coming up a, a week and one month away. I mean, this is, you got to be excited, right? I know this is like, you're probably sleep deprived at this point, but you probably have been for a couple weeks now, but you got to be getting, getting the juices going, knowing that in a month and change, all your work is going to pay off. Oh no, this is, yeah, I I live for this. This is great. We have pro days going on right now. So it's been a lot of fun to track those, Um, you know, talking to a lot of people around the league about, you know, what's the buzz uh, you know, players that maybe no one's talking about that are moving up, maybe moving down, injury stuff. So th- there's a lot going on behind the scenes uh, that's going to affect how the draft plays out. So, you know, it's 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 going to be fun. It's, it, it feels like we're still pretty far away, but, man, we're, yeah, almost a month away. That's crazy. It is crazy. And let's talk about some of these offensive tackles. Up top, Penny Sewell. A lot of people have him as the draft's top tackle, and you've been hearing about him for a long time, for the better course of two seasons now. But right behind him, Rashawn Slater, and some people actually have Slater above Sewell. So for you, how do you have those two ranked, and what makes them the top tackles in this class? Yeah, I think it's Sewell Slater uh, in that order. Um, With Penn and Sewell, it's his big man balance, uh, his mobility, the overall instincts that he brings. Uh, at the position that, especially considering he's not going to turn 21 years old until October. So it doesn't happen often where, you know, one of the best players in the draft is also the youngest, but that's the case here. Uh, he was born a few weeks before Tom Brady threw his first NFL pass. So, uh, you know, I, I don't know about you, but I feel pretty old with that. Uh, and look, there, there are some holes in Sewell's game. He's not a perfect player. Uh, his timing could be uh, improved. I want to see more of a consistent mean streak from him on a snap-to-snap basis uh, just to be a better finisher. Uh, Plus, he opted out this past year. So there are some questions there. Uh, But the physical traits, the ability to make split-second reads, uh, just a really, really impressive combination for such a young player. And his uh, head coach at Oregon, Mario Cristobal, has said he thinks Sewell's the best player he's ever been around. So, And he's been around a lot of good football players. And so the scary thing is he's you figure he's only going to get better with that type of ceiling. So to me, uh, Sewell's the top tackle this year. And then behind him is Rashawn Slater, uh, a really interesting player, another opt-out like Sewell. Started as a true freshman at Northwestern, uh, a program not known for starting a lot of freshmen. Uh, two years on the right side, one year on the left side. Uh, and it was really his performance last year against Chase Young that uh, got the attention of NFL teams and, you know, kind of announced himself as a high level player. Very technically proficient. Um, I, I love how he he's so physical with his hands and he plays out in front. So he attacks edge rushers 
before they can break out a move, before they can counter. Um, I think that's what he does best. His dad, Reggie Slater, played in the NBA for like eight seasons. So Rashawn, I definitely got some of those big man genes. Uh, the biggest question mark really is just the arm length, uh, 33 inches, not what NFL, what, what several NFL teams desire as an outside, uh, as, a, as a tackle, but it wasn't an issue on tape. And so could he move inside and play guard or center? Absolutely. And some teams, that's how they have him on the draft board. But uh, I think when you look at what he offers and the skill set, he has legitimate five position versatility. And I think that that he's he can play tackle, but I'm, I'm going to keep him outside before I move him inside. Okay, so if you, you kind of led to my next question here. Let's just say in the hypothetical situation, the Jets are in position to take either one of these guys. Mm-hmm. And you figure the Jets are set at left tackle with Makai Becton. Of the two... Based on what you said, would you say that Slater is the more likely one to give you position flexibility even to play right tackle or on the inside? Yeah, if we're talking strictly position flex, then I, I think Slater will get the edge there because, uh, you know, we've seen, you know, he's actually been working out a lot uh, at center, snapping. Uh, I think his skill set is perfect for guard. Uh, but again, I'm, I'm keeping it up tackle until I have to move him inside. So, you know, I think... You know, he might be the long-term right tackle, uh, but also give you uh, some snaps inside a guard as well, where Penny Sewell, I think he's more of your natural left tackle. Could he move inside? Probably. But I don't know that his strengths match up necessarily as an inside player compared to outside. Could he play right tackle, theoretically? Yeah, yeah I, I think he could. And, and again, it's, you know, it's it, some, some of these guys make that transition pretty flawlessly. Some guys, it takes them a little bit longer. So, um, I, but I, I do think Sewell could do it. Okay, so if Sewell, let's say, is as close to being a lock for a top five pick as you can be, what is Slater's projection right now? I think Slater is somewhere in he's somewhere in the top half of the first round, um, and it just I think it comes down to uh, you know what you're looking at position wise for each team. So you know you look at the Bengals sitting there at five. If Sewell's off the board and they really want to go offensive line, we could see Slater go as early as the, the fifth pick overall. Uh, but at the same time, I, I think normally what we see a player like Slater, he's more likely in the, the 10 to 15 range. So uh, you look at the Cowboys at number 10, I think they're going to be in the mix. Uh, possibility there. The 49ers could be a, a possibility. Uh, you know, the Patriots, uh, it, there, there's a lot of teams, the Chargers, uh, 13, a lot of teams picking in that that kind of back half of the top 15 that, that could certainly use a, a talent like Rashawn Slater. So let's say the Jets are on the board at 23 and they'd like to go in the direction of a tackle. Who are two players that you think could be available and would make sense for the Jets? Well, that's kind of the beauty of this offensive tackle class is, you know, we just talked about two players that belong in the top half of round one. But the, the position doesn't fall off after that. There's some interesting versatility uh, at that position, and I think it, it stretches throughout the first round. So two guys that could be available, and maybe they're gone by 23, but if they are, then they could still be available. Uh, you know, They're going to be uh, two guys that the Jets are talking about, and that's Christian Derrissaw out of Virginia Tech and Tevin Jenkins out of Oklahoma State. Uh, Derrissaw, inside-outside zone scheme in college, 35 starts at left tackle, uh, very efficient with his movements. Uh, he's a bulldozer in the run game. He can create movement. Uh, he can seal. He can widen run lanes. I think really the biggest question with Derrissaw is he tends to be a, a 90% player. And what I mean by that is nine, he, he goes hard for about 90% of the play. He just doesn't consistently finish. He tends to hit cruise control, which is kind of frustrating to watch. But the body control, the feet for a guy that size, really, really impressive. Uh, and then Tevin Jenkins, four-year starter at Oklahoma State, uh, experienced both guard and tackle, very uniquely powerful. You know, some guys, they'll throw up the bar 30 times in the weight room. They, they've got that weight room strength. Jenkins, he's he's uniquely powerful with his ability to control the point of attack. Uh, he, he has a chance to go for the kill shot. He takes it. He, he will not pass. Uh, and he'll send defenders in, into tomorrow when he gets that upper hand. So uh, occasionally you'll see some balance problems for him. But, uh, you know, uh, and, and then balance problems when we talk about arc speed. Uh, that, that's really when he gets, uh, you know, a little bit tied up. But light feet, he's a smart player. Uh, reminds me a little bit of uh, Cam Robinson when he's coming out of Alabama. Uh, you know, a, a pretty solid lineman with, uh, with the Jaguars. So a guy that gives you some pos- uh, position flexibility 
and just a solid, uh, you know, right tackle who can play inside a guard as well. Why do I get the sense, based on how you described Tevin Jenkins, that he would be pretty good friends with Makai Becton and their playing style? Yeah, I think that that's fair to say. Guys that, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're bullies, you know, and that's an offensive line. You got to embrace that bully role. Uh, and I think both these guys do where, you know, they're, they're a little bit of gentle giants. Uh, you know, you don't necessarily, uh, you, you know, get that vibe from them off the field, but on the field, yeah, stay out of their way. Cause they're not going to miss on a chance to put you into the ground. Yeah. I saw Tevin Jenkins is, uh, headshot on the Oklahoma state website. Yeah. Doesn't look like he would be a bull. Yeah. yeah. See a, a guy you pass in the, in the library on the, on the way to class, you know, it looks like a, <laughs> Yeah, just a, a, a well-mannered kid, but uh, you get him on the field and just ask Joseph Asai. Uh, you know, usually when you hear, you know, block them off the screen, you hear that term. Usually it's just, uh, you know, it's a cliche and, you know, it, it's not literal. Uh, watch the Texas tape. He literally takes Joseph Osai, the Texas pass rusher, off the screen uh, with his blocks. So uh, just a, a really fun player and an easy guy to appreciate with that play personality. And in terms of Darisaw, what you described, I feel like doesn't sound or doesn't bode well for him. Like, how do you fix that in a player if you're like, oh, he's really good for 90% and then the other 10% he's like, eh, whatever. I mean, that doesn't sound like it bodes well for Darisaw as a projection. And also, does he have any position versatility? Maybe not experience, but do you think he could do it? I, I, he's only played left tackle uh, at Virginia Tech, but I do just looking at his body type and the strengths of his game. I think he could move inside, but you know, not actually seeing it on on tape uh, that there's a projection there. Um, you know, the ninety percent thing it's it's frustrating because a lot of times it's like okay, you know, uh, all you have to do is just you know keep going and uh, until you hear the whistle, just keep going and you know finish your guy. And so I, I don't know that it's necessarily a it's not something that would keep me from drafting him, but you better believe it's going to, you know, force a lot more questions and, you know, talking to his coaches about it and talking to him about it and uh, just trying to get more out of him because the talent is there. Like I said, the body control, the balance, the feet for a guy that size, you know, you just don't see it very often. And so you don't necessarily want to pass on him, but you want to try and figure it out. You know, what's going on, you know, what can, is something we can improve upon, um, it, it's something I'd have a lot, I bring in my offensive line coach and have a long talk with him and with, with, uh, with Christian and just try to figure it out. And this is exactly what the pre-draft process is for. What used to be the in-person meetings, of course, now are the zoom meetings, but this is where teams, coaches figure out why they want to draft certain players or why they don't want to draft certain players. So let's say the jets don't go at tackle at 23 and they're on the board at 34 and they're like, this is the time to do it. Give us two players who you think could be on the board then and fit the Jets. And again, these two players, you know, there's a chance they could go in the first round. Uh, you know, you just tackle, obviously, as a position that a lot of teams need. And so those guys usually go up uh, maybe a little bit earlier than uh, even where we project them. But theoretically, they could be available the early portion of the second round. And I'm talking about Texas' uh, Sam Cosme and Notre Dame's Liam Eichenberg. Uh, Cosme, really a self-made player in a lot of ways. He's a son of Romanian immigrants, didn't start playing offensive line until a sophomore uh, year in high school, and he really developed himself. Uh, 34 games uh, started at Texas, first on the right side, then on the left side. He does a great job uh, sitting in his stance, uh, leveraging power, uses that knee bend to strengthen his anchor. Uh, in pass pro, just a uh, a guy that keeps his feet, his hands, his eyes all on the same page so he can stay square to defenders. I, I, you look at his pro day results, man, he, he blew it up. Uh, really, really impressive workout. 4-8 uh, in the 40-yard dash. Just a, a quality player who I think tests well, he plays well, uh, he projects as a starter of this league. And then Liam Eikenberg, not as physically gifted maybe as Cosme or even some of the past offensive tackles we've seen come out of Notre Dame. You know, Ronnie Stanley, Mike McGlinchey, uh, who, you know, the, this staff, they coached uh, or some from the staff coached over in San Francisco. But Eichenberg, just a, a rock solid player, uh, fundamentally sound. He works hard to stay centered to his blocks, uh, strong punch, plays under control. He's a cut down on the penalties, little little uh, excessive penalties than I expected for a, a senior with his type of experience. But just a, a consistent player due to his technique, due to his instincts. Uh, I think he'd be a solid B-level starter in the league. When you mentioned Eichenberg 
as a rock solid player, given the landscape of this year where there were opt outs for or across college football. And then there are guys that didn't play because their seasons were canceled. If you're a rock solid player, do you think that bodes well, not just for Eichenberg, but any prospect more so this year than ever? Sure. Yeah. I think guys that, you know, don't have major injury questions, um, you know, guys that uh, are sm- uh, uh, football smart, football tough, you know, th- those types of guys that the coaches go to bat for at their programs, that that, that might mean a little bit extra uh, this year, uh, you know, with uh, taking some of the guesswork out of it and maybe not trying to, uh, you know, go for the, the the high risk, high reward type of guys, but, you know, going a little bit, uh, you know, meeting meeting in the middle and going with a high floor player. So Liam Eikenberg, I think, certainly fits that mold where he's not as athletically gifted as, you know, McGlinchey was or, you know, some of these other tackles in this class. But, you know, when you when you look at his technique and you look at the way he plays and his experience at left tackle, uh, that, that's going to translate, uh, especially if you need a guy that's going to step in from from day one and give you snaps. So uh, both these players are, are solid uh, solid players and, and why there's a chance they might not be available in, in the early portion of round two, because they might be, might be too good. A lot of these teams in the late first might say, Hey, you know, we, you know, you look at the chiefs sitting there at 31 or uh, you know, the Steelers at 24 teams that could use tackle help. You know, they look at these high floor players and say, you know what, instead of trying to go for maybe this flashy receiver or, or the, the four, three corner, let, let's go with the guy we feel translates really well. And, and let's go for the tackle. You know, for the Jets, they obviously have their answer at left tackle, but the offensive line can't have enough depth there. But do you think that it's more appealing, just generally speaking, let's say as an evaluator, where a player such as Tevin Jenkins or Samuel Cosme, where they have experience on both sides compared to Christian Derrissaw and Liam Eikenberg, who have pure experience at left tackle, is it more appealing maybe for teams to draft the player that has proven that he's played on both sides of the line compared to maybe let's just say for an argument's sake, the better player at one position. It certainly matters. You know, it's, it's certainly part of the report and something that is talked about and weighed when you, when you're trying to stack your board, Uh, you know, with teams, they're not going to go into draft day debating these guys. You know, you stack them on the board and you, you you understand your rankings and what they're based off of. And when you're stacking these guys, certainly where they played, the versatility that they offer at the next level, that plays a part. Um, and that's why in, in my draft guide, I've got uh, games played and games started every single for every single player and every single report. Um, and not only games started, but where they started. You know, some offensive linemen in this class have started at four different positions. That is certainly an interesting part of their evaluation because even though maybe it's not their strength at guard, they at least have that experience. And so if you need them to kick into guard in a pinch, they could probably do it. So it's certainly a big part of the evaluation process with offensive linemen. How many games have they started and played? And then not only how many, but but where? And do they give you that functional versatility to help you out in a pinch if needed? Dane, who's a round three player that you like in this draft class? So one of the more interesting players in this class is Walker Little uh, out of Stanford. Uh, And not only one of the most interesting tackles, but one of the more interesting players overall. He he put himself on the NFL map uh, as a sophomore left tackle at Stanford. Former five-star guy, so highly recruited. Uh, He played really well as a a left tackle in 2018. But then in the 2019 opener, suffered a season-ending knee injury, and then he opts out of the 2020 season. So basically... There's two years of development missing from his game. You know, if you want to watch him on tape, you got to go back to 2018 uh, or the 2019 opener. So uh, there's just a lot that we just were kind of left guessing with him. Um, but projectable size, 6'7", 315 pounds, balanced athlete. Um, a lot of the foundation traits that he offers uh, it, it translate really well and, and things that you want to coach up. So he's got a discount sticker on him because of the, just the lack of tape the last two years, but the talent is certainly there. So a little bit of leap of faith, but you're really intrigued by the ceiling that he offers. And let's say he does hit that ceiling or comes close to it. If he did that in college, what round would we be discussing him in now? 
Oh, first round pick. I mean, he, he has that type of ability. Um, but, you know, in terms of play strength, in terms of technique, um, timing, you know, he, he's big. He can move a little bit. He's a balanced athlete. You know, that's great. But in terms of the finer points of the position, you know, where are you in your development? And, you know, we can see him work out. He had a pretty solid pro day workout uh, in terms of his numbers, in terms of the position uh, specific drills. But in live fire, when you've got, you know, Carl Lawson rushing at you, it's a little bit different. So, you know, there's just, it, again, it's a little bit of a leap of faith there. But yeah, I th- he was on a first round trajectory before he hurt his knee uh, in that 2019 opener. And so it was a bummer we couldn't see him uh, in the 2020 season. It was a bummer. He decided not to play in the senior bowl. Uh, so again, there's a little bit of guesswork here. But if he hits, uh, that third round pick is going to look like, uh, you know, you made a genius move. All right, let's wrap up the tackle talk with a diamond in the rough day three player that you think deserves a little more attention. Uh, a player I really like out of the Mac, uh, Tommy Doyle out of Miami of Ohio. Oh, Miami of Ohio. Uh, grew up in Minnesota uh, playing, what else, hockey. Uh, that was his sport. Uh, and he was a big time hockey player. But in high school, he outgrew the sport, started playing football. Uh, he really was, he was a linebacker at first. Then they moved into the defensive line, played a little bit of offensive line. Uh, he goes to Miami of Ohio. They put him on the offensive line and they just groomed him from there. Uh, only 30 career starts. Uh, well, I say only that it's a good amount of starts, but you know, unfortunately we didn't get a chance to see him too much this past year because of the shortened season, um, a little too segmented in his movements. He's still figuring out, you know, pad level and body posture, things like that. Uh, and that could be an issue at times because he is so tall, but he's tenacious uh, and he's got that raw athleticism that you want to develop. So he's a quality mid to late round option that you could bring in, develop, and you might have a, a long term starter on your hands eventually. You know, Tommy Doyle is listed on Miami's website at 6'8, 326, and I can't not picture him on skates, which is terrifying. <laughs> so a man of that right. size to be able to be agile enough to once play hockey. Obviously, like you said, he outgrew it. First of all, I don't know if you've seen the Mighty Ducks, but this guy needs to play Fulton in whatever rebrand or reshooting of the Mighty Ducks there will ever be. Oh, yeah, absolutely. The enforcer. Yeah, the guy that, uh, you know, is going to bring a little bit of some intimidation factor. Uh, Not afraid (laughs) to mix it up. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I mean, Mighty Ducks was based in Minnesota, so I'm sure he grew up uh, here and that, because I'm sure he was a big boy, uh, you know, middle school and youth league and things like that. So I'm sure it's not the first time he's heard that. Is there any traits that you can almost kind of project from hockey to left tackle? Because I, 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 Hey, I'm reaching here, but you did tweet that you were studying soccer tape the other week. So I figured right. that when it comes to Dane in the draft, all things are on the table. Well, yeah, I was looking at a tight end at a UCF who uh, was actually uh, went to uh, college to play soccer. He was a big time soccer player in high school, and you know the just you know wanted to see what kind of athlete he was, and it just you know it it, it helps in terms of that projection. Um, you know, in terms of hockey, I, honestly, I don't know a ton about hockey, but you you mentioned agility. You you have to be some type of you know balanced athlete out there to uh, not only skate but skate uh, with some, some type of speed and coordination. Uh, so I, I would think that bodes well. I don't know too many hockey to football converts uh, at the NFL level. This, this guy might be one of the first to, at the NFL, to play in the NFL, but uh, pretty impressive uh, if he's able to do it. And I think based off his film, uh, you know, he, he can make that transition and, and really develop into something. You know, you got to be light on your feet to play hockey. I played hockey growing mm-hmm. up and, I'm not six eight three twenty six, and let's just say you know it is hockey is a difficult sport to learn. And also, Blake Cashman played hockey up until a certain point in his career okay. when he came. When so, I mean, he might have just done like pond hockey, but he did tell me yeah. that he played hockey. So, which another makes sense. another Minnesota boy, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. So no, that's that's interesting. That makes sense. That's interesting. All right, so that was a good tackle talk. So let's head over to the fan questions. We got two of them today. We're gonna go to Andy first. And he wants to know which offensive tackle is more likely to convert to the interior of the offensive line in the pros. Yeah. And this is a, um, it's funny looking at my guard rankings uh, of the top seven, I think there's what four of them that are college tackles. So, you know, you're talking about, and, and it's always tough when, when you, you know, some teams will be looking at these guys as tackles, 
Some will look to move him inside to guard. So there are several ta- – I mean, and a guy like Elijah Vera Tucker out of USC who – uh played guard uh his first few years at usc but then austin jackson goes to the draft he's a first round pick for the dolphins uh and vera tucker he's their best lineman so they kick him out the left tackle out of need and he plays really well uh but even though he played really well at tackle i, I think his long-term future is going to be inside a guard is where he plays best um and there's some interesting ones guys like alex leatherwood out of alabama and jackson carmen clemson uh, guys that are, you know, teams are a little bit split. Some view them as a tackle and some view them as a guard, but there are certainly several candidates this year who are going to be top 100 picks. We're just, you know, the, the, the position they're going to play is a little bit split depending on scheme and who you talk to. You know, it feels like every year there's this exact debate. Does the player have long enough arms to remain outside? I mean, you mentioned Rashawn Slater doesn't have the ideal arm length right? and teams might view him as a guard, but just let, let's put this to bed. Have there been players that you know tangible examples of that have had that short or non-ideal arm length that have succeeded at tackle that come to mind? Well, the the, the one that immediately comes to mind is Joe Thomas. Uh, I mean, he he's going to be in Canton here in a few years, uh, and I think his his arm length was was under thirty three uh, inches, which is you know usually the the benchmark for a lot of teams is thirty four. They're looking for over thirty four inch arms. Um, so, you know, for a lot of teams, it's 33, uh, anything under the 33, they don't even consider it, but you're missing out on a player like Joe Thomas in that, uh, in that sense. So, um, it, you know, it, it, it's something that length helps you make up, you know, the margin of error. Uh, so if maybe if you're not as quick laterally, maybe if you're not as technically sound, the length will help mask those deficiencies. But if you're really quick, you're fundamentally sound, uh, you know, you understand timing and, you know, your, your depth as a tackle, your landmarks, then you don't need to have uh, the, the go-go gadget arms to, to compensate. And I think Rashawn Slater is a perfect example of that. Uh, he might not have the amazing arm length, but he also on tape, he didn't really need it either because of, of the way he played. And so I think that'll translate to the next level. A guy like Zach Martin uh, come out of Notre Dame. He was a, a four-year starter at left tackle for the Irish, and I think he had enough length to play outside. But just looking at his body type, the, his strengths as a football player, he was a perfect convert inside the guard. That's what the Cowboys did, and you know he's been a Pro Bowl player for uh, you know seven, eight years now. So you know it's each player. I, I, you don't want to look at it and say, oh, look on a piece of paper and say, oh, thirty-two and three quarters arm, automatically guard. You have to look at the tape. You got to look at the player, his body composition, his his strengths as a player before you really make up your mind what position he's going to play. It goes both ways, is basically what Dan is saying. So, sure. uh, and with that, we're going to wrap up the final question here. William wants to know: Is it plausible that the Jets trade with the Bengals, who have the number five overall selection? The Jets, of course, have the number two overall selection, so that Cincinnati can, in fact, select Panay Sewell to help protect Joe Burrow. I would say probably not, not plausible. Uh, the Bengals don't trade up. Uh, that's not their. That's not that's not, not what they do um, as an organization. So I, I don't think we'd see them do that. But I, I, I can appreciate that because you know we talk a lot about uh, you know trading up for quarterbacks in this draft. And you know if the Jets don't draft a quarterback at two, okay, well who's going to go up to get a quarterback? Who's going to get the quarterback? Well, it, who knows? Maybe it could be a tackle. Uh, but I think when you look at the depth of tackle in this class. You know, you don't need to use an extra draft pick to go up. Even as, as special as Penny Sewell is, you, there's a good chance he's going to be there at five for the Bengals. And even if he's not, you feel good about your plan B, C, and D um, in the second or third round. So I, I like the thought process, but I would be pretty shocked that that's, uh, that's how it played out. All right, let's have some fun here to wrap up this episode. The Bengals get crazy. They trade up to two to take Penny Sewell. The Jets are at five. Let's say for the sake of this argument, they don't go quarterback because you would figure if you wanted your quarterback, you would stay at two and just right. take the player. Who are you taking at five, assuming that player is there? And I think I know the answer to this, but I don't want to spoil it. Does he play at Florida? Because uh, I think yeah. that's the direction I would go. Uh, Sean Davis. Talking... No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The safety is a little small, but you'll like him. I promise. No, uh, <laughs> Kyle Pitts, 6'6", 240 pounds. Uh, the guy's special. I mean, you know, we, we talked about him, obviously, but he's just a difference maker. Um, you know, cheat code, unicorn, whatever, whatever uh, you know, 
word you want to use to describe how how unique he is. Um, he's an instant playmaker, and you know we you can't bring up past examples of top ten tight ends and say, oh, this guy didn't work. That that this guy's different. He, he's just different, and I would not hesitate to use a top ten pick on on Pitts. Put him in my offense. Line him up in line, line him up in the slot, and just you know drive the defense crazy with the different options that we would have. So what would you think about a, a Jets offense that has at the skill positions, specifically receiver and tight end, Corey Davis, Denzel Mims, Jamison Crowder, now Keelan Cole as well, and huh? with the fifth overall selection, Kyle Pitts. And they also have Chris Herndon. Yeah, no, that's that's a lot of fun. Uh, and I think, yeah, you look at Denzel Mims, he's your prototypical X. Corey Davis, he's your Z. Crowder, uh, your Y. You got Cole, who I think can play across the formation. Uh, and then Pitts, yeah, he he's your mismatch guy because he can he, he can play outside, he can play inside, he can play in line. There's so many things you could do with him. So yeah, I don't. As much as I would, I, I you know personally, I would go quarterback. There's a part of me that would definitely love to see that. Uh, you know, it'd be a lot of fun, regardless who the quarterback is. It'd be a lot of fun to try out that skill talent. Yeah, and I think that what you just went through in your head is the exact feelings that a lot of Jets fans are having. As much as they like the quarterback, it is also appealing to just beef up the skill position players and ride into 2021 and have the chips fall where they may. Dane, that was another episode of NFL Draft Preview presented by Verizon with the Athletics' Dane Brugler. Dane has to go watch some more hockey tape. We got to get out of here. Dane, thanks a lot. We'll talk to you next week. All right. Thanks, Ethan.